So we're back with Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Directed by George Lucas, written by George Lucas, starring almost everybody from the previous two films. Three years after the events of Attack of the Clones, the war against the Separatists is coming to an end, and certain things are starting to come to the surface due to certain actions by Chancellor Palpatine and Anakin's slow descent into the dark side out of fears of losing his wife in childbirth. Revenge of the Sith had a lot riding on it. This is going to be the movie where we finally see how Anakin turns into Darth Vader. I can remember very specifically, I was 14 and a half years old, going on 15. The hype and marketing campaign for this film was off the charts. Darth Vader in the trailer rising on that gurney, hearing the breathing, James Earl Jones's voice, I get shivers just at the thought of that. Despite the disappointment of the previous two films, Star Wars fans, as far as I can remember, they were really riding on this one to really drive the point home. In a lot of ways, I would say George Lucas managed to set things right. To call this the best of the three prequels, that's kind of an obvious statement, and I would agree with that. To call it one of the best Star Wars movies, though, I don't know if I would go that far exactly. But there are a lot of Star Wars fans who feel that way, and some of you guys in my audience actually do too. And that's totally fine if you do. I completely understand. Before, a couple of days ago, I can't remember the exact last time that I watched this movie in its entirety. As I've gotten older, I started to notice the flaws, like with the other two prequels. But I wanted to see how I would feel about it now, all these years later. Almost 20 years, which is just... Again... So insane to think about that it's been that long. I have to admit, though, the final result, it's actually pretty good. I enjoyed the film. If I'm being honest, if I were to update my ranking, I think it would be somewhere in the middle on the spectrum. There's still a lot of issues I have with it, and we'll get to it as we go on with the review. In comparison to the previous two films, I don't want to put words in George Lucas's mouth, but if I had to guess what the feeling was making this movie. I get the impression that he was thinking, okay, I really dropped the ball with the last two. I gotta try to salvage something out of this one. And in a lot of ways, I would say he did. This film still had its detractors at the time, although they're not nearly as vocal as they were back then. This is still, in a lot of ways, a huge improvement. And if you somehow still have never seen Revenge of the Sith, we're going just about all into the deep end of the pool on this one. The film immediately jumps right into the action with this big space battle above the planet of Coruscant. Lucas really caught on to this aspect of the movie. This one goes right for the throat and doesn't waste any time. Chancellor Palpatine's being held hostage by the Separatists above the planet and they're trying to get away, with Anakin and Obi-Wan going on a rescue mission to rescue the Chancellor. For copyright reasons, I'm going to try to keep this as tight as I can, but the opening drumbeat when we see the Republican cruiser above Coruscant... Even after all this time, it still gets me excited. It has a very great flair of a military cadence march. Especially in comparison to the last two, the interplay between Anakin and Obi-Wan as they're flying in their Jedi starfighters, this feels more like the classic Star Wars flavor that had been missing in the previous two films. Obviously, if you're a first-time watcher of this, you know that they're not going to die, not in this situation. But in a way, it does kind of get your nerves going, because Obi-Wan starts to get swarmed by all these buzz droids, then Anakin has to try to find a way to get them off of him, then R2 manages to kill one of them by shooting at its center eye, although R4 is not so lucky. And this is just a small moment, but when Anakin is trying to dodge the missiles from the droid Starfighter, I just love this little interaction he has with R2 right here. We got him, R2. Right off the bat, Hayden Christensen is a lot better in this one. There's still a couple of moments in here where it feels more or less like he was in Attack of the Clones. I really put the blame on George Lucas on that one because he still doesn't know how to properly direct his actors. What he goes through in this movie, Anakin Skywalker, that requires a lot out of an actor. I think for the most part, he manages to hit those required beats, but we'll get to that as we go on. The first thing to notice about Anakin in this one, he's a lot more level-headed and calm. Like when Padme dropped out of the droid control ship on Geonosis, he ordered the pilot to put the ship down and Obi-Wan told him no. He's in a similar situation where their wingman gets into trouble, but then Obi-Wan tells him, no, 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 they're doing their job, let us do ours. And he has this look where he realizes, okay, he's right. Our mission is the top priority. And I think this is one of the better uses of the I have a bad feeling about this line, when they destroy the shields on General Grievous' ship, and then with the hangar door closing... About this. Some things I have to point out with this battle, and I realize that this is delving into nitpicky territory, but if they're trying to escape from the planet Coruscant, which is the capital of the Republic, why are they still that close to the planet? I know there's a reason that's explained in the books or the novelizations or whatever, which is fine, but couldn't you at least explain it in the movie? Not an info dump. 
And that's the same thing I could say about other things in this movie and with all of the Star Wars movies. Some kind of context goes a long way. This opening sequence really consists of Obi-Wan and Anakin making their way towards the area where the Chancellor's being held. R2's trying to hide from these super battle droids. General Grievous is catching on to what Anakin and Obi-Wan are doing. It feels in a lot of ways like a classic Star Wars adventure, which I'm not against. If anything, this is a breath of fresh air after what we experienced the previous two times around. There's still a few dumb moments though when they make it into the elevator and all of a sudden they realize that battle droids are behind them. The battle droids don't even shoot at them. And the same thing happens when Anakin is hanging from the ledge of an elevator door. The two battle droids don't even shoot him there either. It's plot armor, I get it, but wouldn't you at least have some kind of a minor scuffle in there? I'll be fair, this is very nitpicky. It doesn't hurt to throw some kind of tension in there. Although I do really like the small interaction right here. Well, R2 has been uh, known as wire jokes. Did I say anything? And he's trying. I didn't say anything. This was something that was desperately needed by Anakin and Obi-Wan in the previous two films. Admittedly, yes, too little too late, but... I'll take what I can get. Oh, and R2 using the oil on the super battle droids and setting them on fire is just so hilarious, but I wish that was able to be put to good use in the other movies that he was in. But it proves Leia right, though. Never underestimate a droid. Then they arrive in the holding area where Chancellor Palpatine is being held. But Count Dooku shows up and they have another lightsaber fight, and Anakin manages to best Count Dooku, and Obi-Wan is thrown across the area like a little punk. But when Dooku throws this walkway onto Obi-Wan, I thought, shouldn't he have been paralyzed or impaled or something from that? Even when I was 15 years old, that never made any sense to me. And then when Anakin gets the drop on Count Dooku and Palpatine goads him into killing him, the fact that there's no music and it's just really quiet, talk about a haunting moment. The first big step of Anakin's final journey to the darkness. Eventually, they're brought before General Grievous after they're captured by battle droids. Just to get this out of the way, I have never been a fan of General Grievous. In all of the Star Wars movies, he might be the least interesting and probably even the worst character. Even with all the extra stuff with the Clone Wars DVD that came out in the mid-2000s, or even in the recent Clone Wars TV show, I still don't understand what the appeal is about him. He's just a CGI villain that George Lucas thought would be cool to create, who could have a really big lightsaber fight with Obi-Wan towards the halfway point of the movie. If anyone tells me that this guy is better than any sequel trilogy character, don't even go there. So they have a scuffle with Grievous and some of the battle droids, and he manages to get away, and then the ship starts to go down towards the planet. In a scene that's actually kind of exciting, but really it's hindered by the lack of urgency from all the characters. It's similar to the previous two films, so I don't think it's really necessary to go into it. If this were any other director, Obi-Wan would have said something like, okay, let's just hope to the force that we make it out of this alive. So they bring the Chancellor back safely. Anakin has his reunion with Padme in secret, and then he learns from her that she's pregnant. And he doesn't really look too thrilled about this. Maybe he does in a way, but his reaction has always felt very odd to me. I think he also realizes, uh, if anybody finds out about this, I'm gonna be in big trouble. The romance between Anakin and Padme is a lot more bearable in this one, although it still has a couple moments that make my eyes roll. You're so beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. I'm not trying to sound mean to anybody involved here, but God, that is so bad. <laughs> Sidebar here, though, when Padme talks about their child, it does get me wonder what would Luke and Leia's life have been like had they grown up on Naboo instead. Ever since the Marvel What If TV series, my brain just can't help but think in those types of ways. The What If scenarios, it's a very enticing idea to think about. But then Anakin starts to have nightmares about Padme dying in childbirth, just like he had with Shmi Skywalker, his mother dying, and his fears of not being able to stop people from dying resurface again. He brings his fears to Master Yoda, albeit in a very filtered way, because he doesn't want to let on that he's married to Padme. And Yoda basically tells him to get over it and just say, Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. On the one hand, I do like those words of wisdom, but on the other hand, it kind of frustrates me that he would tell Anakin to get over it. I think he could have at least said something like, look, Anakin, I hear what you're saying. Your feelings are totally valid, but be very careful on how you process them. It could lead you down a dark path. Just one more item on the list of problems I have with the Jedi, especially in Revenge of the Sith. I know I keep saying it, but 
Trust me, we're gonna get to it. So after Anakin's initial frustration with the Jedi, he gets summoned by Chancellor Palpatine and is appointed to be his personal representative on the Jedi Council. Something that Anakin, I guess, did want to be a Jedi Master, although it was never really mentioned in the previous two films from what I remember. He informs the Council of what's going on. They allow him to be part of the Council, but not give him the rank of Master. And of course, Anakin's not too happy about this, but through a private conversation he has with Obi-Wan, he learns that the Jedi wants him to spy on the Chancellor in order to find out what he's up to. Since Chancellor Palpatine's gaining more executive powers from the Senate and the House, the Jedi start to suspect that there's something sneaky going on behind the scenes. At least that's the vibe that we get from the movie. I mean, they don't really explore the inner workings of what the Jedi are thinking about the Chancellor. There's clearly some sort of distrust in that he's staying in office a lot longer than he should have been. I do like that the movie acknowledges, okay, something's not right here. And if you are a Star Wars fan and you know where this is leading, it does kind of add to the tension. But for any newcomer, the tension does start to rise a little bit. And I do kind of like seeing that. And I have to say, when Obi-Wan brings this information about how Anakin feels about his assignment, Obi-Wan expresses doubt about whether or not Anakin is the Chosen One. And Yoda responds with... A prophecy that Miss Red could have been. Oh, trust me. I want to get on my soapbox so badly about this Chosen One BS. But I'm going to save that when we talk about Rise of Skywalker in a couple months. Shifting gears here, when Anakin has a small conversation with Padme about how the war is affecting the Republic, and even for me at 15 years old, it was actually kind of... No, it was actually very relevant at the time. I mean, it's not too far off from how people felt about the Bush administration at the time. And you know what? Some of that can be said about today, no matter where you stand on the side of politics. Even some conservative commentators at the time criticized this movie for being too political or too against George Bush. The kind of stuff that we see today with the sequel trilogy or even some other projects in Hollywood that are quote-unquote woke propaganda. That kind of BS has always existed, even before the last few years. I guarantee you, if social media was around back then, it would be so much more noisier and so much more obnoxious. Prequels, if you ask me, are probably the most loaded with politics, especially in comparison to the sequels where they didn't really have that much political messaging in the first place, minus a couple of spots here and there. But we'll save that for another video that I got coming up soon. Another small moment here, Padme asks Anakin to hold her. This is riding along the lines of Attack of the Clones territory, but thankfully it's not in there for very long. But so when she says what she says, I thought, oh, God. Maybe I did mention this in my previous two reviews of the prequels. I do really love the design of Coruscant. This feels very much like a lively version of New York City in the Star Wars universe, mixed in with Washington, D.C. If I were to pick a favorite spot in the Star Wars universe, it would probably be Coruscant, because I, I have a thing for a living in urban environments, I suppose. This is a place where you can tell that there's always something going on. Then there's the scene where Anakin is at the opera with Chancellor Palpatine, and he learns about Darth Plagueis the Wise. And I just remembered, real quick, as he's running up into the theater, this guy right here is George Lucas in a small cameo. And rewinding back the clock a little bit, we actually see the Millennium Falcon as they're bringing the Chancellor back to his advisors. Is this the same Millennium Falcon that Han Solo flew, or is that just a different copy of that model. Neat little Easter eggs, though. I don't know exactly what's going on with that opera, if it's just some kind of a big light show, but Anakin has a talk with Palpatine, who learns about General Grievous's location, and then he tells him about his frustrations with the Council, and somehow Chancellor Palpatine knows that Anakin was asked to spy on him. How does he know that exactly? But then he tells him about the legend of Darth Plagueis. This whole scene is chill-inducing. We can clearly see that, okay, they're setting up right in our face is that this guy is going to be the Emperor, that this guy is bad news. He brings up a Sith Lord with the first name Darth. What other Sith Lord do we know at this point in Star Wars besides Darth Maul? Darth Vader. It's explicitly clear that the Chancellor is talking about himself when Plagueis was killed by his own apprentice in his sleep. Not to mention this line right here. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. In what other Star Wars movie did we hear that line? The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. Chances are, he might have figured out how to cheat death, like he talked about with Anakin in his throne room. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi.
I have to say, Ian McDermott, even though some of his acting is very over the top, he is probably the best actor in this whole movie next to Ewan McGregor. If anything, you could watch this movie for Ian McDermott alone. Even if you didn't like how he came back in Rise of Skywalker, there's no denying how much fun he is to watch every time he's on screen. That being said though, Anakin should be a little more freaked out by the mention of Darth Plagueis. He just kind of takes it all in and goes, uh, no. No, I never heard of him. I mean, is he really just so aloof that he's not even going to question anything? At some point, you got to recognize a red flag when it's right in front of you. After this conversation with Palpatine, Anakin starts to go further down the rabbit hole of darkness. Realizing that something's happening, but he's not really sure if he wants to go there, but he's desperate to save his wife Padme. And I got to say this about this part right here. Watch how George Lucas directs Hayden Christensen here. And so then you're, you're very strong on that. It's, it's almost... Said with not, a little bit of anger, a tinge of you know, I will you know, determination mm -hmm. and anger. I will not betray the Republic. Mm -hmm. You know, my loyalties. So you're turning on, but it's you know, it's like a, I will not betray the Republic. That's you kind of that's your rationalization for everything you've done. I'm not trying to be too harsh on the guy. I know there's plenty to criticize George Lucas for, and it's all been said many, many times. But now that we're in an age where the prequels are practically beloved by the Star Wars fans, got to try to bring them back to reality in some way and say no. Be realistic. So Obi-Wan goes to confront General Grievous and they have a lightsaber duel, which starts off. Hello there. Don't even think about getting me started on the plethora of memes that have come out of this movie. That is a whole other pile of craziness that I am not going to be able to Fully assess in this video here. I have seen so many memes in regards to those two lines, especially the high ground one. It is so overblown by now. Besides Spider-Man 3, Revenge of the Sith has had the biggest impact on meme culture. I will deal with this Jedi slime myself. Your move. Think about this duel. How exactly is Obi-Wan able to defeat a guy with four? Watch the fight in slow motion and tell me there's not a single instance where Grievous could have easily killed Obi-Wan with one strike. And the thing about him killing General Grievous on Utapau, this doesn't really have any relevance to the narrative. As far as the plot goes, yes, it's important that General Grievous is killed in order to end the Clone Wars. What does this do for the character of Obi-Wan? Actually, nothing. I mean, I do really like Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan, and I think in a few moments that are sprinkled throughout this movie, he really does shy. I just think that there could have been a lot more character work with him, kind of like what we got in the Kenobi series, although that's another discussion entirely. I might do an updated video on that one day. But in reality, this is all just plot and no narrative or character progression. He manages to kill Grievous after a big chase while he's riding on that big lizard feathered creature that makes really weird high-pitched sounds, that even after all this time, even when I haven't watched the movie in so long, they still echo through my brain every now and then. And that's a huge credit to the sound design from Ben Burt. And I gotta mention, when he's duking it out with General Grievous like in a fist fight, and he kicks Grievous in the leg, that had to hurt. Good riddance to General Grievous, because... Excuse my French, but I couldn't give two shits about that guy. <laughs> But back to Coruscant, when the Jedi learn about the clone army attacking Utapau. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. The dark side of the Force surrounds the Chancellor. Really? I had no idea. Did it ever occur to you that the Chancellor is the dark side user that you guys have been looking for? Could you just be any more oblivious to everything wrong that's happening with the Republic and the Force, you go all the way back to the Phantom Menace and they hear that a Sith Lord has appeared after a thousand years and you barely react. And you don't even question in the sequel, why does the Chancellor have a clone army? The Jedi did this to themselves. They're complete morons who can't see something wrong when it's right in front of them. If anyone tells me that was the point. I don't care. I'm sorry, I, I promise I wasn't gonna get so heated on this topic, but I guess I kind of did. Still, it doesn't make for good creative storytelling. Which leads us to Palpatine's next conversation with Anakin. Anakin talks about his frustrations with the Jedi, and then Palpatine reveals that he knows the dark side. And then he reveals that he knows that Anakin is married to Padme. 
I don't know if it's my biggest issue with the film, but it is a major, major problem. Everybody says that Rey is too overpowered in the sequels because she can heal people and is able to fly the Falcon. Not perfectly at first, mind you, if you remember correctly, but nobody has a problem with him knowing somehow that Anakin was asked to spy on the Chancellor and that he's married to Padme? Excuse me, but no, I call bullshit. He's not a secret genius. He's literally God walking on Earth. Even his own granddaughter Rey wasn't that powerful. All that being said, watching him reveal his true intentions to Anakin is a very tense moment, telling him that if he wants to become a wiser leader, and a powerful one, you have to succumb to a new way of thinking and a new type of training. Oh, 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 I want to say a lot about that, but I'm going to save that for my surprise video. So, whoo, oh, let me tell you, though, just with certain things that I had in mind about this scene, I was shaking in my seat at the thought of that. You'll know what I mean when that video comes around. And once again, Ian McDermott in this scene is so enthralling. I can feel your anger. It gives you focus, makes you stronger. Oh, that, even back then when I saw this, that was really cool. And then a crucial scene comes where Anakin has to make a choice. Does he stick to his Jedi teachings that he's been learning for the past 13 years? Or does he put everything behind him in order to save the one he loves the most? No dialogue except for an echo of what Palpatine said. Anakin looks towards Padme's apartment building. Padme looks back to the Jedi temple where Anakin is. And they can both feel each other. Even though Padme's not a force user, she knows that Anakin's in pain and emotional pain. Due to copyright reasons, I can't play the scene for you, but if you were to watch it, this says a lot and nobody says anything. Getting a moment like this in the prequels is very hard to come by. In light of everything that happens throughout the saga, watching this scene really adds to the experience for me personally. So Mace Windu and a couple of Jedi Knights, they go to arrest him and a lightsaber fight breaks out. And the lightsaber fight is pretty laughable. Ian McDermott's facial expressions through this whole scene are just what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> but I did notice this pose he takes right before he starts fighting them. Like grandfather, like granddaughter, right? But then Palpatine fights back with force lightning, which repels off of Mace Windu's lightsaber back onto Palpatine, and it gives him the scarred look that we remember from the original trilogy. I still remember my initial reaction. I was horrified when I thought, that's why he looks like that. Oh my God. But this is another crucial moment where Anakin has to decide, does he protect his wife? Or does he stick to the Jedi ways? Ultimately, he chooses to protect his wife. And Mace Windu dies at the hands of Palpatine. And this is the crucial moment that we were all waiting for when he turns to the dark side. I will say this, as he slowly descends into the darkness, I found it very convincing personally. Seeing Anakin go from very desperate and reluctantly submitting to the darkness, but then fully embracing it as he steps into the light while he's on his one knee. Chill-inducing every single time. Although his name choice of Darth Vader, I was really shocked at the time when I first saw this. Now it's like, um, where did you come up with that? He's basically saying, you shall be known as Darth Vader. Like, there's no reasoning behind it. It, 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 it just happens. But then he gives Anakin his orders to go to the Jedi Temple and wipe them all out while he, Chancellor Palpatine, will settle things with the Galactic Senate. As far as Anakin turning to the dark side, him going to the Jedi to slaughter all of the Jedi Knights and younglings that are there. This is the question of, do you buy the turn to the dark side or do you not? A lot of people do, but some people don't. I'm kind of in the middle, but I, I guess ultimately, if I have to really boil it down to it, no, no, not not really. I, I don't really buy it. Yes, I understand his frustrations with the Jedi. Him going on a killing spree on all the Jedi Knights in there that is too big of a jump. Case in point, the Martha scene in Batman v Superman. When Superman says Martha and Batman goes, why did you say that name? And Lois Lane comes in saying, that's his mother's name. And he goes, okay, we're pals now. That's not a character progression. That's a character jump. And the same thing applies right here. I think this movie gets a pass because it's a prequel. So we know that Anakin has to become Darth Vader. And to anyone who said that they didn't buy that Luke would kill Ben Solo out of instinct in The Last Jedi, keep in mind, not everybody was sold on Anakin's turn to the dark side in this movie either. Don't act like The Last Jedi is the only exception to this rule. As for the Order 66 scene, admittedly is a powerful scene to watch. But if it weren't for John Williams' music, it probably wouldn't have landed. I do like seeing Yoda's response as he's able to feel through the force what's happening throughout the galaxy. And you could tell that it's really, really hitting him hard in the gut. And him decapitating those two clone troopers that are going to kill him. Yeah, that was pretty badass. Oh, and also he's friends with Chewbacca, who helps him to his escape pod. 
I, I don't care if some people thought that was dumb. That was just so wholesome to see Chewie in this one. And somehow he was going to get captured by the Empire. I guess with the Empire there. Kind of makes sense. So Obi-Wan barely manages to escape. Gets in touch with Senator Bail Organa, played by Jimmy Smith, who's a senator from Alderaan. They meet up on the blockade runner, the Tantive Four, which is what Leia will fly in in A New Hope. Obi-Wan's call for help to Bail Organa always kind of frustrated me. Because all he says is, my clone troops turned on me, I need help. I'd be freaking the hell out if I were him. I'd be saying to Senator Organa, my clone troops turned on me. What the hell's going on? Meanwhile, Anakin is sent to Mustafar to kill all the Separatist leaders on the orders of Emperor Palpatine. So Palpatine has a speech where he's declaring that the Jedi were trying to overthrow the Senate and that the Republic will become a galactic empire. And everybody in the crowd, except for Senator Organa and Padme and their guards, applaud him. And they don't even question what he's doing. So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. I said some years back in one of the videos I did on The Last Jedi that How Liberty Dies line was very bad. I take that back, actually. I think it's very, very powerful, and it's historically relevant in a lot of ways. George Lucas's love for history and how societies form over time, it's very clear throughout all of his works in Star Wars. Regardless of how you feel about his execution, I do really like those ideas he has in mind. And then Obi-Wan finds out who led the killing of all the Jedi in the temple. It can't be. It can't be. anymore. That's it? That's it? There's people online who will say that Obi-Wan was in denial. That's a bunch of bull. He should be absolutely devastated at what he's seeing. Anakin was his brother, for all intents and purposes. He should be a lot more emotionally destroyed and shattered by what he saw in that hologram. I'm sorry, I don't buy that counter-argument. But then he manages to sneak aboard Padme's ship as she goes to find him on Mustafar, and then she later meets up with him there after... Anakin kills all the Separatist leaders, which, by the way, when he kills Viceroy Gunray, that is so, so cathartic that it's not even funny. One of the biggest morons in the entire Star Wars saga, besides General Grievous. Padme pleads with Anakin to come back with her, but then as he goes on with what he feels like he's able to do to Palpatine and how they can rule the galaxy and whatnot, Padme starts to realize, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute, Obi-Wan was right. You, you're not the guy that I married. Gotta hand it to Hayden Christensen. He really sells it here. I audibly said out loud a few nights ago as I rewatched this. This guy's out of his mind. You turned her against me! You have done that yourself! You will not take her from me! <laughs> and then the lightsaber fight breaks out. Out of all of these three movies, I probably like this one the most. The Duel of the Fates is fun, but due to the personal stakes involving these two as friends, it's done well enough for me in this film to care. Although the lightsaber fight does get a little ridiculous when they go on these walkways and they're swinging, scratching each other's lightsabers back and forth. After a while, it just turns into overkill. It's like, okay, okay, okay. Can we just keep it condensed and not go too big for its own good or something? But then there's the fight with Yoda and Palpatine when he walks into the office and knocks the two cars unconscious. I remember very specifically, back when I saw this in theaters, everybody in the theater just blew up laughing. Even now, I still get a kick out of it. Although, how did he manage to sneak in to the Emperor's throne room like that? That's like if somebody was going to try to walk into the Oval Office. That's just not possible. The interaction between Yoda and Palpatine is, I think, maybe some of the best moments in the entire saga. And when he throws Palpatine back into the chair, I love seeing the Emperor getting really scared. Even though the Emperor is very cocky, when he realizes that he's facing off against the greatest Jedi of all, even he's horrified, and he knows better than to mess with Yoda. And although I don't love the idea of Yoda using a lightsaber... I'm okay with it in this situation, because these are two of the most powerful Force users in the galaxy. Yeah, I think it's perfectly excusable to have them duel against each other with a saber. Maybe there's some who will argue otherwise, but I'm okay with it here. It's not quite as ridiculous as the Anakin and Obi-Wan lightsaber fight, but seeing Yoda jumping onto all the Senate seats as the Emperor's throwing them down with the Force, it's almost like George said, okay, we know that you're tired of the politics, so I'm just going to destroy the Galactic Senate house for you. So the fight ends in a draw. Yoda manages to sneak away with the help of Senator Organa. Then we cut back to Mustafar, and we have one more fight between Anakin and Obi-Wan as they're on the Lava River. And right before we get to the I have the high ground moment, something Anakin says here that's always kind of bugged me. I should have known the Jedi were plotting to take over. Seriously, Anakin. What are you talking about? Again, going back to the character jump, I don't find it believable that he thinks that the Jedi turned against him, when all it really was 
was his frustrations with the Jedi Council. If he had said to Obi-Wan, yes, I betrayed the Jedi, but I did what I had to do to save my wife, then I would have been okay with it there. But then we have the moment of the high ground and Anakin tries to get the jump on him. And this moment here where Obi-Wan just cries out in agony, I can't help but feel a little bit of emotion, especially in light of the Kenobi series. You were my brother, Anakin. I loved you. Got to admit, it does bring a tear to my eye. And seeing Anakin getting burned up was horrifying. And even now, it's still really hard to sit through. I remember at the time that this movie's released, there was a big deal about the PG-13 rating and that it would go a little more hard in on the violence. This is probably the most violent that Star Wars has ever been. And seeing him get burned up, you can really see Anakin's pain manifest itself as he gets burned up. And of course, it explains why he needs that Darth Vader suit ultimately. Any normal person in that situation would have died within minutes. But because of his intense hatred and bitterness towards Obi-Wan, that's what kept him alive. And when he's brought back to Coruscant and is suited up, along with Padme giving birth to twins, Luke and Leia. The symmetry of these two moments is just beautifully conveyed. The death of Padme, the birth of Darth Vader, but also Padme giving birth to the new hope, quote unquote, of the galaxy. But I gotta talk about Padme's death. I've never believed it for one second. I mean, the notion that Leia remembers her mother, that she died when she was very young, inconsistencies happen like that throughout a lot of prequels. I'm not too bothered by that, although it does kind of make me go, how could you remember her if she didn't die that long after you were born? But she died of a broken heart. I mean, the medical droid says she's completely healthy, but she's lost the will to live and she's dying. <laughs> okay, okay. Even at 15 years old, I thought, hold on, that that doesn't add up. If she had some kind of underlying medical condition or if Anakin choked her too hard, maybe I would buy that, but dying from sadness? Bullshit. I don't know a single mother in my life that would rather die of sadness than be with their children. I know there's instances where people die of extreme depression or sadness. I'm not trying to come off as insensitive, and if I do, I apologize. I'm not a dad, but if I had children, there is no force on earth or heaven that would get me to abandon my kids. But back to Vader being suited up. This look that Anakin has as the mask closes in on his face really says a lot about what Anakin is thinking in that moment, knowing that his life is never gonna be the same after putting the suit on. And then after that, There's no words to describe how that makes me feel. <laughs> that is just pure fan happiness. Even with all the issues I have with the prequels, that, that makes me feel fulfilled. <laughs> in the theater that I saw this in at the time, dead silent. Everybody was in awe, especially when he rises up on that gurney and the music's going, ah, da, da. And James Earl Jones's voice, God rest his soul, further adds to that fan satisfaction. But of course, George had to ruin it with this. <laughs> Should have had a temper tantrum like Kylo Ren. That would have been a lot more suitable. Yeah, I said it. I also really like seeing how they decide to separate the twins, so that way it would make it harder for them to find what's going on. And it lines up with what Obi-Wan's Force Ghost tells Luke in Return of the Jedi. Bail Organa agrees to raise Leia. Obi-Wan brings Luke to his aunt and uncle on Tatooine. And the ending is really just them connecting all the dots and bridging the gap between the prequel and original trilogies. Leia being brought home to her adopted family on Alderaan and seeing Luke brought to his Aunt Peru. The musical part that plays in this moment right here Knowing the full story of Luke Skywalker in this entire saga, I'm not kidding. I, I literally start to cry. I mean, Luke Skywalker is one of my all-time favorite fictional characters, so that might have something to do with it. But that ending with the binary sunset playing, yeah, never gets old, no matter what trilogy it is. So Revenge of the Sith is actually not that bad. I would say it's an overall pretty decent movie. Again, if I were to rank it somewhere on the spectrum of Star Wars, it would be somewhere in the middle for me. It has a lot of issues, like I mentioned, but I gotta admit though, there's a lot of other great moments in here too that can really sell me on what the characters are feeling, and it does connect a lot of the dots on those categories, not just logistically, to the other films. And in light of everything else that's happened afterward, before and after, at least release-wise or chronologically, depending on how you view the timeline of events. It does really add to the experience, at least for me anyway. And for a while until 2015, when Disney released The Force Awakens, the first set of the sequel films, this was the end of the Star Wars saga. And some people will say this is where the saga ended, or Return of the Jedi. <laughs> 
We'll soon find out in time if that sentiment still holds any water, but I don't think it's going to, but we'll see. Uh, how Star Wars fans feel about the prequels now, I've said a lot about it in other videos. I might do another video on it one day, maybe just to clarify some things I said some years back on the How Star Wars Fans Ruined the Franchise for me. I still stand by a lot of what I said. For anyone who still insists that the sequels are so much worse and that Kathleen Kennedy is to blame or that J.J. Abrams or Ryan Johnson are to blame. No, 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 no. I put all the blame on the people that attacked George Lucas when he was making the prequel trilogy. <laughs> I think anybody that's like Kathleen Kennedy and like Disney, I think that you, I think you're so dead wrong. Sure. I don't think you can be more wrong yeah. about who's to blame for the state of Star Wars. You got nobody else to blame but yourselves. No one to blame but yourselves. So that's really all I got to say about Revenge of the Sith and all of the prequel trilogy. Thank you guys so much for watching. I've had a lot of fun talking about all three of these movies. It's still Star Wars, so there's always something that each movie, even some of the lowest of the lows, can offer something of entertainment value for me anyway. And I also hope you guys enjoyed hearing my thoughts, even if we may or may not disagree very strongly on some of these things with Star Wars. Really excited to show you more of what's coming soon, especially with my two bonus videos I got for Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, and to revisit Rise of Skywalker in a couple months. Really curious to see how I feel about that movie now, five years later. Thanks again, guys, for watching. Comment below and tell me what your thoughts are on Revenge of the Sith. And as always, see you in the next one.